day to you all. This is a next podcast broadcast on change dynamics, and we're absolutely happy today to have Carla Johnson with us. And Carla Johnson is a well-known author, a bestseller author even, and a well-known speaker on a lot of subjects. And one of the subjects that we're going to talk about today with her is about the, um, uh, the, the digital marketing strategies. And this might touch upon the subject that this podcast is always about, which is about change dynamics. And the thing we were puzzled about is the fact that the change is around us very, very much in high and intense changes going on. But companies sometimes seem reluctant to effectively introduce the change in their own way of working. So this is the question that we're asking, and we're still puzzled why this is not going at the speed that you would, you would um, expect to happen. So, Carla, nice to see you on the show today. And is there anything you'd like to add to my very brief uh, introduction? No, I, I'm delighted to be here. And I think uh, as we talk about digital marketing, digital transformation, innovation, I think change is really at the heart of a lot of those things. Yeah, absolutely. That's true. So that's why we, we thought it very useful to, um, to talk to you. Okay, well, let's focus on one of the first issues, which is, you mentioned that already a little bit, the, um, the relation we have between change mm -hmm. dynamics and your work in getting the whole um, digital marketing strategy running and getting a change effectively uh, happening in companies. Is there anything that what you could mention as the common ground between those two subjects, change dynamics and your digital marketing strategy? Absolutely. And I, um, there's a cartoon that I've seen over the years. And the, in the cartoon, there's someone standing like on a stage behind a, a podium. And the person is asking the people in the crowd, who wants change? And everybody raises their hand. And then the next question that the speaker asks is, who wants to change? And nobody <laughs> raises their hand. And I think that's, I think that's very true of a lot of things. I think it's our nature as humans that we avoid change because we think change equals danger. And I think with, with much of what we see with change in digital marketing and <clears throat> business that we're in today, it's hard to understand that the need for change is actually an, a way to express continuity between what the past has been and the future that we want to bring our, our customers into. Um, we all know customers change. And it's really interesting to think that there's this, this resistance and this lag for marketers and businesses to keep up with that change because the whole reason we're here is for that opportunity to serve customers. So it's, it's a really interesting dynamic, but I think a big part of that is, is understanding how we operate as humans and how we think and what some of those common threads can be between the past that's very familiar and the potential that we have for the future that people don't know, you know certain for certain what that might look like. Yeah, the funny thing, I think you're absolutely right. There's reluctance to change, even to an extreme extent that, that uh, what we are famous for is that we wrote a book on project sabotage. Um, that's an extreme uh, element of not going along with change, but resisting to change to the, to the level of blocking the change and um, uh, executing sabotage. That, that's an interesting uh, thing. And I'm absolutely agreeing with you that there is a, a tremendous reluctance to change, despite the fact that companies need change to simply to survive. You know, absolutely. And I think we, you know, there's no better gear to look back on and say that change is inevitable. And I think um, the last 12, 14 months have proven to us that either you change or circumstances will force you to change. And so when the pandemic hit and people were forced to work from home. Companies had to change the dynamics of how they looked for business, how they served customers. There were a lot of companies who had said, you know, we'll get around to digital transformation, but there's all these other things that are so much more important first. We're going to take care of those. And, mm -hmm. you know, unless there's, you know, a, a, an urgent need or an urgent deadline, a lot of things don't get done. Well, all of a sudden there was definitely an urgent need and companies mm -hmm. that hadn't been able to get a leg up on digital transformation for the last 15 years. Now, all of a sudden in, you know, 15 days, we're able mm -hmm. to make that tremendous shift. And yeah. it, it, it is a sign of when the urgency or when the need is there and people understand why it matters that they're much more open to change. 
Yeah, I agree. Would you say that the uh, cost reduction that you see in a lot of companies being executed is a barrier to change? You know, I, I think that if the focus is always on cost reduction, what it does is it, um, it puts a mindset into mm -hmm. all employees' minds of, I shouldn't, or I can't, mm -hmm. or there will be consequences if I do. And change isn't about always cutting costs because I think one of the big opportunities that we have with innovation is to look for opportunities. And when I look at the companies who have really thrived in this last year, they've been able to take this tremendous amount of change that's been forced upon us and really look for the opportunities in it, whether that is um, becoming fully digital or having a you know fully digital aspect to the company or being able to serve customers differently. We see this with a lot of small and medium-sized businesses who you know have gotten very creative and very innovative in, in how they've done things. And I think that's a big opportunity that we have with change as it relates to innovation is that innovation is inefficient and that doesn't mean that it's cost effective. But we have to look at the long-term outcomes and benefits that comes from teaching an entire employee base about the need to look for opportunities. And, you know, everybody loves to feel good about the work that they do every day. And I think just going to an office and doing the same rote repetition work every day, particularly if it's manual, if it's, um, you know, very uh, time consuming, something like that, that can be um, put into a, a digital type process and then mm -hmm. free, the, free people from the minutia of some of this work and let them do some more exciting kind of projects, things that really add more value that only a human being can add mm -hmm. to an organization. I think those are tremendous opportunities for change that I see companies make a great leap forward as they look at how do we make things you know, more efficient in the long run, but also be able to look for opportunities and solve these you know, different kind of problems that we have every single day and be able to become more adaptable. And so when we look at change only as the, the process of cutting costs and making things more efficient, we miss probably 80% of the opportunity that change can bring. Yeah, I, I think I, we can agree. And the, the, the idea, of course, is if you invest in change, then probably on the long run, the company will come up with a new idea and, and simply earn money with new ideas instead of losing money by selling the old ideas. The uh, other question I have is, uh, one of the things, if you are, uh, what, what we saw, we started already from uh, the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic we have now, the uh, working from home. At the one hand, it creates opportunities, of course. Eh? What I also see in the company I work for went uh, all digital, so uh, working from home, and they did it in an amazing short time. Eh? So uh, we, we within two, three weeks, everyone was able uh, to increase the capacity of the system. Everything worked from home. But at the other hand, there is a question, of course, now we are working from home and on the other hand, it might also be killing for your business because you don't see your uh, colleagues in uh, person. How, how, uh, what is your point of view on that? You know, I think, I think there are pluses and minuses from both aspects. I think that the opportunity that we've had this past year in understanding how flexible and nimble mm -hmm. and adaptable we can be in a very short amount of time and be able to work from home has been tremendous because I think there's been a lot of companies that have said, oh, it, it would never work for us. You know, it may work for a Google or an Amazon or a very high end tech company, but we're kind of an old fashioned, you know, fill in the blank type company. Even, even medical offices, I don't think I've been to an actual doctor's office in the last year, but I have had many telehealth medicine appointments. And I think it's, it's that push into how things can be done differently that, that make a difference. Now, I think one thing that helps people as we work from home is a little bit more flexibility in perhaps maybe you know, the work hours or how we organize our days. And that can also be good, but some people really need that structure of, you know, I need to be at the office at a certain time. I need to make sure that I leave at a certain time and, and have that structure, which we can create to some degree in our, in our own world. I know I worked from home for 20 years now and, and creating that kind of structure is very good. And it's also been interesting. I can't remember the source of the research, but there's um, 
a creativity index that's been done by an organization in the last three years. And interestingly, creativity has gone up, um, I think almost double digits in the last year. And much of it is mm -hmm. because of work from home. And I think one of the things that it does is that it frees up our minds from certain things that we're used to having to do, perhaps commuting, which can be something that drains people's mm -hmm. energy. You know, it can be the stress of being under fluorescent lights or, you know, in a, in a physical environment mm -hmm. that isn't necessarily conducive to how we function best as humans. But I think the other part that's, that's missing, and I even see this in many of my introverted friends and colleagues who have enjoyed working from home this last year is that human to human interaction. Um, I call them hallway or, or water cooler conversations. Yeah, yeah, Just yeah. the dynamics of what happens in those spontaneous interactions that can't be replicated in the current work from home environment. It's not something that can happen in a, in a chat in Slack or you know another yeah. conversational channel. And I think that is something that while many people will say, you know, work has changed forever and we're always going to work like this because look at all of the money that companies are saving in you know, um, leasing space and you know, yeah. physical buildings and things like that. They're not taking into consideration the human element and productivity mm -hmm. and collaboration and ideas and, and, and opportunities to find opportunities and, right. and solve problems that comes from being together as actual people and, and how yeah. we interact and, and do our yeah. work best. Let, let, let me see if I can pick up the, the, the urgency issue because we, we just found out that the urgency by, caused by pandemic caused tremendous uh, change. As simple as that. At the same time, we saw that the uh, the change dynamics is at a too low rate for companies to uh, to cope with the the change around them. So, what what could be the what could be the reason that we once the urgency goes up in case of pandemic, we change very rapidly, and then when we see the regular change, so to speak, which is dynamic, there's there's mm -hmm. a tremendous dynamic in the environment. We still don't pick that up. So, why why could be the as you said reluctance to change that. I would say it would disappear if you would go ahead with stressing the uh, importance of urgency. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's a great question. And it's one that I find really interesting. And I think one that leaders of organizations and leaders of teams should be aware of because it, again, it's a tremendous opportunity. Anytime there's times of chaos, times of stress, times of, of upheaval, one thing that is constant and consistent is that every employee in every company expects change to happen. So I don't think there's anybody in any organization of any size who after the last year thinks that things are gonna go back to the way that they were. They expect change to happen. So now under this sense of urgency and, and upheaval that we've had, it's the perfect time to really take advantage of change mm -hmm. and catapult things forward because people expect it. People know that things can't go on the way that they have. So let's look at what could be. And I think when we were um, talking a few minutes ago before we started mm -hmm. the podcast is that we were talking about methods of change. And I think one of the biggest opportunities that companies have right now in this space is that we have an opportunity to tell a story of what the future could look like that creates a continuity of thread that ties it to the past and what's already been done. And I think that's why storytelling is one of the most powerful methods and mm -hmm. techniques to use during times of change. Yeah. And when I looked around at organizations last year, I saw three types of companies. There was the, you know, freeze and paralyze, and we're just going to wait this out and, you know, like hunker down and then we'll mm -hmm. go back to what things are going to do. And then um, there was the middle kind that said, okay, we're just, we're just going to wait and see what happens. So they're kind of on a pause and look mm -hmm. around and, and observe. And then there were other companies that were saying, you know, we know things are going to change and everybody in our organization expects change. So let's, you know, full speed ahead. Let's start making that change happen. Mm -hmm. And I think what has, is interesting about those companies is the energy and the dynamics and all, you know, the bottom line revenues that they've seen in this past year that they may not have experienced had it been business as usual, as you pointed out, you know, when people are less likely to be in the mind mindset to change. That's what you actually see also happening last year. And what I observe in a very classical banking environment, is you see that the meeting dynamics, everything changed from one day to another. And what you even saw is that strategic meetings, everything went in a totally different way and still works. And, and sometimes sometimes even works better. That's the, the, the strange thing. You know, and I think that's, that's how companies who have 
a strong either brand story yeah. or ability to yeah. keep employees engaged. Yeah. They, one of the things they do well is, is that storytelling. They're very clear yeah. about the kind of company they are, who they serve and where they're coming yeah. from, you know, and that brings a continuity into where they are right now. And because of that, there's a sense of, of context relevance, and I think really importantly, trust, so that when those executives start to talk about, here's where we expect the future to go, and this is our plan and strategy as an organization, employees in total trust that vision because they can see that track record and, and that history. And if you think about what if you kept jumping, if you were trying to engage somebody with the story and you kept jumping from story to story to story, people feel disoriented. They don't know what's going on. They don't know who the other characters on and are, and they don't know if they even trust where the plot's going. And I think that's that power of storytelling that happens in organizations that are able to weather change really, really well and, and take advantage of it. Yeah, yeah you, you, you wrote quite a few issues on uh, storytelling and how this is related to leadership because you implicitly you're mentioning leadership because um, one of the things that we could say is a, a, a happy um, and happily uh, employee is a key to change. If he feels well guided, then he might easily go for uh, the change attitude rather than going for resistance. So how, how do you think leadership would fit in there? You know, when we think about change, a lot of it, a lot of what happens is employees are looking to leaders for, you know, information, for direction, for, again, continuity and context. And I think the leaders that have been the most successful are those who have set that, that brand story. You know, here's the kind of company we are. Here's, you know, the purpose that we're here to deliver every single day when we come to work. Here's the customers that we're serving. And they're very clear on their own identity. Mm -hmm. And if you think about these traits being translated into a person, the kind of people that we're, we're drawn to that just feel magnetic, they're very confident about who they are. They're confident about the direction that they're going. And they have this certain like um, je ne sais quoi about, you know, just, there's something about them that we can't always put our finger on. Well, those same characteristics and you know magnetic personalities also translate into brands. And that comes from the clarity of leadership about why you're in business to start with, who you're serving, and that future vision that you have. And when we look at the roles of executives versus the rest of the employees in an organization, it's really the CEO and that executive team that are making promises to employees, to customers, to the market, to stakeholders about this is who we are and this is where we're going. Now, the reason it matters so much to have clarity and context is that it's not the CEO and, and the, the executive team who will make sure those promises are kept. It's every single one of those employees. So you have this group of executives who are the promise makers. Now you have the entire group of employees that need to be the promise keepers every single day through every single effort and experience that they deliver on behalf of the brand. And without clarity from that executive team or those you know, corner offices, it's really hard for employees every single day to make sure that they're delivering on the promises that executives are making. Yeah, but at the same time, the uh, the key of the success is the employee itself. He has to be the key of the success. If he yeah. if it's it's if he if he internalizes the uh, the importance of change, that's what the key of to success is. I presume he can be stimulated by his CEO, but it's it's the attitude towards the employee that makes the the machine go ticking. Absolutely, and and also the role of the executive to to make it clear that. Um, you won't lose your job if there's failure, you know, risk is part right. of the process and, and part of change and creating that space that has safety to try some things, you know, smart trials and tests and things along that line. So it's not just random change and let's see what happens and, and throw it against the wall, but it, it's smart testing and smart change, but realizing that not everything is going to work perfectly the first time you try it. So what do you actually say is, uh... Failure, failure is okay. Mm -hmm. should, uh, Absolutely, it's a failure is part yeah. of the process. Yeah. And maybe even even if we reframe it and stop calling it failure, but mm -hmm. saying it's it's test and learn, yeah. and you know let's let's try these things and see what happens. Now it doesn't mean you have to make these tests on big grand scales the very first yeah. time. It's easy to do incremental tests along the way, 
and add up those learnings and, yeah. and slowly, you know, build the scale of the things that you're testing. Yeah, there is a, a Dutch company working in the States as well would, called Ahold. They are doing the failure of the week. So if there, is a, if, there is, if there is a failure, then rather promoting the success of the week and thereby encouraging people to hide the failure and the learning, they stimulate, okay, someone made a mistake, but we learned a lot from it. So this is the failure and everybody's then stimulated to, to tell them that he might have made a failure or you can learn of rather than hiding the, the failure. So they got a, a system called the failure of the week. That's an excellent, excellent example, you know, where failure or, you know, trial and error learning is really something that becomes to be, comes yeah. to be celebrated rather than avoided at all costs. I really exactly. like that example. Yeah. yeah. And the idea, of course, is that failure is related to innovation and it's also related to resistance to change. If people want to have this, the same story rather than being in the, un, in an unknown area. So that that's a uh, part of the, um, the explanation, I think. Exactly, exactly. If you look, Excellent. A, look yeah. a little bit more at the uh, the employee in an organization, because of one thing I also understood from everything I heard from you, that uh, everyone is part of that chain and everyone should be able to uh, stimulate a change in an organization, sell that ch change. Mm -hmm. uh, if yeah, you're as an employee, what you see, of course, a lot, there's a lot of classical big companies here. Yeah, and probably in the States also, if you are now a, a, an employee in that organization, see something where an organization really, uh, where you could really could help that organization to go, go better, to create more business, to uh, change something. What would your advice be to that employee to uh, change, to bring from his position as an employee, that change into an organization to convince the organization to move ahead? You know, one of the things that I talk about, and, and I actually have um, a book coming out at the end of June called Rethink Innovation. And yep. it goes, what I did is essentially spend five years to study the most prolific innovators, how they come up with ideas, the process they use that um, connects the dots between their inspiration that they see in the world around them and the work that they actually do. And then the last step, which I think is vitally important is how to pitch those ideas. And I think one of the the main things that I want people to understand is everyone can and should be an innovator and an innovative thinker. And many times people in the kind of situation that you exactly described are hesitant to ever raise their hand because they think, you know, I, that's not my job. That's not my job title. Um, I'm not smart enough. You know, I'm not a design thinker. I'm not an engineer. I'm not a, you know, data analyst or a lot of other assumptions and stereotypes that we have about innovators. But one of the reasons that I wrote the book is because I wanted to give everybody at every level of an organization a very simple, repeatable process mm -hmm. that helps them connect the dots between, you know, the inspiration that they have as an idea, how it directly relates to the work that they do, and then how they can pitch that idea in order to increase the chances that somebody will say yes and to start to build this team of support around their idea. And I would say for, for anyone who's always wanted to raise their hand with a new idea, but is, but is hesitant, one of the things that really helps is to be very clear, you know, again, back to that word to clarity, what's the problem that you're really trying to solve, which I help people articulate and then follow this simple process. And I've had everybody from groups of um, administrative assistants use this to um, help solve problems to executives at the C-level, you know, in, in Fortune 500 companies use it. And the nice thing about it is that it, it is so simple, it's scalable, it's repeatable. And I think a lot of times when we think about innovation and change, we think it has to be expensive and huge and disruptive. But really when some of the research I found said that 90% of innovation happens outside of a traditional innovation, you know, team yeah. or area of the business. So in that case, we need every single one of these people to start learning how to become innovators, innovative thinking, innovative, innovative thinkers, and to be able to share those ideas so that they, they can start to change the company, you know, on all of these small incremental levels, almost on a daily basis if needed. Couldn't, couldn't agree more. I'm looking a little bit at the time. I think we are uh, 
almost running out of time and I think we can uh, talk to you uh, hours and hours because <laughs> I think the story yeah. is, is really so nice yeah and what, 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 really I, like. what I what I learned is a few of your statements one of the statements was yeah. risk is part of change which I think is a, a good a good pitch another statement you made is now is the time for change which I think is absolutely right and it fits in very nicely to the change dynamic yeah. subject that we are talking about and another uh, quote that I wrote down is uh, leadership is telling the brand story, which is about positioning the leader into the uh, the change dynamics, which I think is an absolutely uh, adequate statement. And you've mentioned the, the new book coming up, we'll certainly pay some attention on, uh, on, that, on that subject very, very uh, soon. What would be your key advice to a company, to an organization, how to respond best to change. My, my, my first advice is always to put change in the context of your brand purpose. And if people don't have a brand purpose in place, it's, they're going to struggle and have a harder time trying to weather that change because that's the whole idea of a brand purpose and that brand story is to create an anchor and a North Star during, particularly during turbulent times. So everyone remembers, you know, this is why we're here. This is why we show up. And it helps bring collaboration and, and commonality of goals mm -hmm. during the time that is, can be particularly chaotic and have people spin their wheels and be inefficient and, mm -hmm. and focus more on worry than on, you know, the purpose that they're there to serve customers every single day. So yeah. that's the main thing that I would give as advice to executive okay. okay thank you very much okay carlo just stay tuned stay tuned for a second and thank you very much so far for your time and your uh, ideas and uh, well we will probably see and hear and read you soon thank you very much carla thank and you so much it's been a delight to join you yeah. okay thanks a lot it's uh, was really a pleasure